when I'm weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's and all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. And he makes a way. Good morning, church. Good morning. All right, man. It's so good to see everybody here. Good day to worship the Lord, huh? Amen. Praise God. Hey, I'm glad you're here. We're glad to see y'all. It's a little, we're starting, we're doing things a little different as you noticed. Uh, so we just sang a song and now we're doing this. So it's a little different, but just stick with us here, guys. We're looking forward to worshiping God today, hearing from God's word from Ben. Uh, there are a couple of announcements I have is that uh, this Tuesday is the 4th of July, and there is a giant extravaganza at the Wolf's House out in Olive Hill, and everyone is welcome to come. And uh, the only thing we ask is that you bring a side to share, a side or a dessert. All the meat and the main course will be provided, and bring fireworks, because we want to blow stuff up, right? <laughs> All right, don't forget that, you guys. That's very important, both of those things. Uh, the second thing is, is this next Saturday is the men's breakfast extravaganza, and we're going to go golfing afterwards, okay? You have to come to breakfast if you want to golf with us, though. So get up early, guys, and please come and join us here at 8 o'clock in the gym for breakfast, and then we're going to head out directly after that and go golfing. It's going to be an awesome time of fellowship. These are the kinds of things that really bring us together as a church, you guys, that we can really grow together and get to know each other 
to be able to carry each other's burdens, right? I mean, that's what the church is all about, right? So we're going to do that next Saturday. On the 11th is the senior luncheon, which is also in the gym at 11.30. Senior, uh, senior adult, not, uh, not seniors in high school. Okay, make sure I clarify that. And then Empower for uh, Empower slash VBS is coming up at the end of this month. And uh, if you would please sign up early for that online so we have a, a good idea of who is all going to be involved in that. All right? I think that's all my announcements. Oh, and also, if you would like to give, we have three ways to do that. You can give online. You can give traditionally in the pews with the envelopes. Or you can do it by text message. Uh, if you would all stay standing, I'm going to ask Colleen now to come up and read from the Word of God. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's scripture reading is from Colossians 1, 19 through 23. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, do, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray. Father, we just are so grateful that we could come together and gather. And Lord, not only gather, but Lord, that we have freedom, that we have freedom to be with brothers and sisters that are like-minded, that we have freedom to come and worship and glorify your name, that we have freedom to speak the name of Jesus. And I just pray, Lord God, that as we come to worship, that you would help us to put aside ourselves. Lord, that you would help us to put aside any anger, frustration, fears, insecurities, unforgiveness, anxiety, depression. Lord, help us to put aside anything that stopped us from almost not being here today. And I just pray, Lord God, that you would also give us ears to hear and a heart to receive today's message. And it's in your precious name I pray. Amen.
singing over me You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so
Good morning, everybody. I think if we ever need a reminder of how much God loves us, uh, we can just look at that song there, and it, 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 it sums it up perfectly. So I'm going to read from First uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 11, starting in verse 23. And Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And you know, these verses here are, are just to provide a good template as, as to what we should think about about when we're ha during communion time and nothing else. We don't need to think about anything else. Um, it just points out that when we come in here, it's time to actually focus, you know, try to push out the hustle and bustle of the previous week. Try to not think about your phone vibrating in your pocket right now. Try to not focus on, hey, it's rained all weekend, how am I gonna get my grass mowed? Try to think about, or you also, we're coming in here, we're thinking about we got this busy week of work coming up. All this stuff is coming at us in all directions. I just want us to take this time like we always try to and, and move all of that other junk out of our minds at this time and focus truly on what's important. And that simply is the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. And not just that, but on the third day that, that he rose, which makes all of this uh, real and important. So, like always here at First Church, we take communion every week, and we're going to, here in a minute, we're going to take our communi communion collectively, but before, before that happens, we'll take a, a moment of silence so that each and every one of us can, can move all of that noise out of our lives and focus on what truly is important. Okay, I um, ask that you take your emblems out and take the bread, which represents his body that was broken for us. And then this juice, which represents the blood that was poured out to wash away our sins. Pray with me, please. Father, Lord, we, uh, we just have so many things going on in our lives, and often we come in here and, and we just struggle to uh, shut that down. But, Lord, I just pray that during this time today that your, that your presence and your spirit is felt and that we're able to focus on what's most important, Lord. Uh, what we feel is most important in our lives, Lord, is, is, is your sacrifice. The fact that your son came and died for our sins so that we could spend eternal life, so that we would have eternal life. Lord, um, we're so thankful for how much you love us, your reckless love like, we've, like we talked about in the last song. We're, th we're so thankful for the fact that, God, you, you loved us while we were still sinners, and you, and you, you sent your son here to bear the burden of sin, the, the sin of the world. Lord, we love you, and we know that you love us more than we can imagine. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Hello, First Church. If you guys are here with us for the first time, maybe you're uh, 
visiting with us. It's your first time here. Welcome. My name is Ben. I am the lead pastor here. We hope that uh, you feel welcome. hope you feel comfortable here. And uh, I would encourage uh, everyone, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 this morning. We're going to be reading a passage from there. We're going to talk about living well today. Now, this isn't a kind of a, a, a self-help kind of thing is like, you know, steps that you can take to, to live and to live well. I want to talk to us this morning about living well for a living God. Living well for a living God. And the passage that we're going to be using is nine, chapter 9, Verses 11 through 14. I know I'm going to have 13 and 14 up here on the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and go back a couple passages here and begin reading at verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, just a bit of a recap, backstory to set the context just a little bit for this, because, I mean, we're talking about blood of bulls and calves and heifers, and I mean, what are we talking about here? There's some weird stuff in here. The writer of Hebrews is writing to this audience of early church converts. They're Jewish believers, Jewish people who've converted to Christianity and believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And in their day-to-day -day lives and in their faith, they're being oppressed. They're being persecuted, uh, starting to be ridiculed and mocked a little bit. And their tendency and kind of the temptation for them in this moment is to fall back into their own way, old way of life. That, that might have not always been perfect, but it seemed easier. You know, it seemed simpler, right? Does anybody remember simple times? And here you look back on that and you're like, oh man, things were simple back then. Were they really though? I mean, were they really? I mean, we look back on things and we can see maybe in some areas it's simpler. Does, does your life ever feel simple in the moment? Like if, if I'm going through something, I may be facing something now that I look back on in 10 years and go, ah, good times. Simpler times, man. And my brain's going, liar, you are a liar. But they're kind of longing for this because they're looking for an escape out. They're looking for a way out of what they're facing or what they're feeling. Or maybe they've made some decisions, done some things that have gotten them to this place. And they're starting to question that. And they're beginning to think that maybe, maybe those times really were more simple than, hey, I could go back to those. So the writer of Hebrews begins to systematically, piece by piece, pick this train of thought apart. Like, I mean, the writer is, is really just kind of debunking everything. It's like, okay, well, you thought this was greater. Okay, well, here's why Jesus is still better. Okay, you, you attached and you locked onto this. Here's why Jesus is greater than that. And he's done this with individuals, with writings, with spiritual things. And now we've seen last week that the writer begins to talk about the new covenant versus the old covenant. And now the writer is breaking down systematically these systems of offerings. And these systems of atonement and acceptance in the sight of of God Almighty. And that's where the blood of the bulls and the calves and the heifers and the goats and the ducks and the lions, tigers, bears, oh my type thing. That's where all of that comes in. Because there used to be one of those that you had to go once a year, once a year, day of atonement. There had to be a blood sacrifice. It had to be presented just right. It had to be sprinkled upon the mercy seat of the Lord, which was in the Holy of Holies on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And you just hoped that everything went really well with that. Because it was hinging upon someone else for the forgiveness of your sin for that past year. 
Now, I, I used an example, and, and you all laughed, but I mean, it was a pretty good illustration. I was like, how many of you, for your eternal, uh, you know, like for your eternity, would you trust me to make atonement on your behalf? Like, listen, I'm going to trust this guy. And all of you quickly was like, nope. Listen, I come and I hear him every Sunday. That's about the max, all right? That's, that's about my limit with this guy, all right? But that's what would happen is like, you know, they would, this whole nation, this whole people of God would be dependent upon this high priest to have his stuff together just enough that he could get in there and offer sacrifices, that he could get in there and he could present the blood of the perfect sacrifice for that year, and that atonement for those sins. But the writer of Hebrews is saying like, listen, we no longer have to depend upon the blood of animals to atone for our sins because the blood of the perfect sacrifice has been offered once for all. Okay? It was done. And he does these things where he is greater than any system of atonement. He is greater than any system of forgiveness and acceptance that we could possibly come up with. And then the writer makes this statement that through the blood of Christ, who offered himself without blemish to God, that we could purify our conscience or cleanse our conscience from dead works or works that bring about death. And we think about this pure conscious thing. And isn't that what life is about for most of us? Like we live looking for ways to cleanse our conscience. You know, like we want to be able to go to bed at night with a clear conscience. How do you do that? What, and it seems like whether it's a faith-based approach or not, that so much of our world is driven, is motivated, and is pushed forward by this fact of having a clear or clean or pure conscience. Because we all do things. You know, the Bible says that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But we know that even apart from a Christian faith, that there are morality codes and things and, and, and like standards that most of us are trying to live by. And if we're not living by those, then we look to kind of counterbalance those, right? Like if we do something that's not good, we look for things that are as good, hopefully a little bit better, because we like when that, that balance weighs in the favor of a clear conscience. And the Bible talks a lot about, the, about a clear conscience, having your conscience purified. We see Paul in the book of Acts when he's standing in front of Agrippa. We see him talking to him and talking about how important it is for Paul, who's being charged, who's giving this testimony of a radical conversion. He talks about how important it is for him to be able to stand there and to have a clean, pure conscience with what he's doing. We see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, we'll have them up here on the screen, says, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier, may they help you fight well in the Lord's battle. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. And as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. So Paul has given instructions to a young pastor here, but it's also, <clears throat> excuse me, instructions for us as well as to how to keep this conscience that we have clear and clean and pure. According to 1 Timothy 1 here, it is cling to your faith in Christ and keep your consciences clear. But when you have violated your conscience, there's been many people who, and, who have done this, and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. So what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is this thing that we battle with, this internal consciousness which we have. And just side note, I don't have time to articulate this really. Your conscience is not the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now the Holy Spirit works through our conscience, don't get me wrong, but not the same. But we have this internal battle that continually just kind of churns within us as to living in a way that we have this clean and clear conscience. 
Because if it's not, we like strive for that and we're restless and, and our anxiety is, is on the rise. Our level of worry and fear and doubt and all of these things because whenever our conscience isn't clear, whenever we have these things weighing down on us, what we see are those scales begin to tip in the other way. And what Paul tells Timothy here is like, when your conscience is not clear, what ends up suffering is your faith. Because if we try to cleanse and purify our conscience as believers through anything other than Jesus Christ, then our faith is always going to be compromised because we're trying to do it on our own ability. Amen? Uh, you know, we, uh, Ephesians 3.20, that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ever ask or imagine or think through the Spirit that's working in us. It's not about our ability. Anytime that we try to cleanse anything or remove anything in our, our own ability, then it is required for us to detach from faith in order to work in our own ability. I'll give you just a moment to think on that. Anytime that you move into the realm of doing something in your own ability, you have detached it from your faith in Jesus Christ. And I love the word that the NLT uses here, shipwrecked. Yeah, I think if there's an epitaph that's ever going to be placed on my tombstone, if my wife's in charge of it anyhow, here lies Stuart Benjamin James. Dude was shipwrecked. <laughs> like, you know, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of what happens whenever I step out on my own and into my own ability to do things. So this purifying of conscience here that's talked about in Hebrews chapter 9, it serves to save us from dead works. What are the dead works? The dead works are anything that we try to do in our own ability. Ergo, the entirety of the law of the Old Testament. Like all of those laws, what started out as 10, wound up 600 and some plus, just trying to grab at straws, just trying to have something that we can latch onto here that is actually achievable long term for us. Did you ever notice, like, even with the Ten Commandments, most of those are achievable for a moment? Like, right? Like, I can, I can do this thing. I can not be mad. I can not have lust in my heart. I can, I can honor and I can respect my parents. Teenagers, say it with me. I can honor and respect. No, nothing. Okay. All right. But we're able to keep laws for the moment. But whenever it becomes a requirement of it becoming a lifestyle for us and a way of life, that's when we fall short over and over and over again. So those are the dead works. We even see an example of it in John chapter 8, one of the most famous passages in the Gospels, is when Jesus is teaching in the temple. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, they bring in this woman and they throw her in front of Jesus. It's like, hey, never mind, we got a Bible study going on here. Just go ahead, interrupt, it's fine. But they throw her and they were like, Rabbi, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Now the law of Moses says that she is to be put to death. What do you say? Scripture even recognizes that this was a trap that they'd laid out to, to try to entrap Jesus. Jesus just gets down, starts writing in the dirt. Now, there's all kinds of theories as to what that writing was. Nobody knows. But we do know what he says after that. Those of you who are without sin, let him cast the first stone. If she is to be stoned to death by the law of Moses, then okay, go, go ahead. But I'm going to throw this caveat in here on you. If you are free of sin, then you be the one to throw the first stone. It says that the Pharisees, the scribes, started departing slowly but surely as their consciences started realizing I still have sin in my life. And guess what? These are the religious leaders of the Old Covenant. Dead works that could not keep long term. Could not keep long term. They were the very pinnacle of what the faith should be. Could be. And even they were disqualified. Why? Because they were dependent upon their ability, which led to dead works. 
So let's talk about living well, because it says that you're purifying your conscience to serve a living God. What I want us to focus in on this morning is living well for a living God. I'd be curious, is, is that your heart in here this morning? If I were to ask you, it was like, do you want to live well for the living God? Would that, would, would that be it? Is that what you want? I hope so. It's what I want. I don't always achieve it, right? But that's what I want. Live well for a living God. I believe the Bible gives us some indicators. I believe it gives us some charges and some markers that we need to use. But first, I kind of want to lay the foundation of what entry-level Christianity should look like. Okay, if you have uh, your Bible still there in front of you, Romans 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. I'll be reading the first couple verses here. Paul, writing to the church at Rome, starting in verse 1, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. Verse 1 kind of says it there. Present your lives, present your bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, some of the translations will say there, which is your reasonable act of worship. What Paul indicates here in this passage is that you laying your whole life down on the altar of Jesus and turning everything you have over to him is not something radical. It's not something that's only expected or commanded or wanted from a select few. Laying our lives down on the sacrificial altar and saying, Jesus, everything I have, everything I am, everything I could possibly be is yours. That is entry-level Christianity. Like, whole life sacrifice for Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of your relationship with him. That's not the goal we ultimately obtain at some time that we reach maturity. Living as sacrifices, whole, complete, total life turned over to Jesus Christ. That's what Paul describes as our reasonable service to God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm up here preaching, and I'm failing that foundational course. Like, there was a lot of 101s that I had to repeat in college. Like, we went down into double digits. I couldn't get the 101s, all right? And this is one of them that I continually strive to be better at, to do better at, to turn my life more over. And, and I don't always live well for the living God. And I don't think you do either. Not all the time, right? This, this whole life thing is what gets Jesus says that I want everything. I want you to give me everything that you have. So how do we do this? How do we take steps? How do we grow in our relationship with God? How do we become more of this living sacrifice, this offering, this reasonable spiritual service of giving everything that we have to Christ? I think there's a few basic biblical markers that we can look at and we can say, okay, here's some elements that I can put into practice into my life. So we're going to be real practical for this, for this part of the message and give, hopefully give you some things to take away and some applications that you can work on. Uh, we're going to talk about the rights. All right. And the first right that you need to have is you need to have the right information. You need to have the right information. If we're going to live well for a living God, we need the right information. And talk about something that's important for us today as we are inundated with information. Like Anybody ever feel like you are just on complete overload and overwhelmed with the amount of information that comes your way on a daily basis? Right? And like unwanted information. Like, listen, I don't know... I don't know if I was ever meant to know what's going on in Russia the moment it happens. 
I'm not saying it's not important. But I don't know if we're supposed to know what's happening over there within 30 seconds of it actually happening. It's like an information overload. And we get this from everywhere. It's all over the world. Right? I mean, like, we get news in a moment's notice. And it's not just... Anybody ever grow up with party lines? Telephone lines in your house, the party lines? That was fun, wasn't it? Okay, so people who aren't familiar. Back when phones were attached to cords. And you had to do this thingy on a rotary phone. But then it was not only attached to cords, it was attached to a wire coming into your house. And then the wire went out the poles. And it had other wires. And there was this whole big connectivity thing. And it was not wireless. But let's go beyond that. There was something called party lines, which means that you didn't have a dedicated phone number. Or if you had a dedicated phone number, you just didn't have a dedicated phone line. That meant that you could pick up. I remember, listen, I was, I was teeny tiny, all right? I'm dating myself here, but I still remember this. I mean, it, it was still in the days that my mom was getting after me for eating whole sticks of butter and drinking Pepto-Bismol out of the can. Okay, so I mean, let's, let's anyhow, anyhow, <laughs> you're learning a lot about me right now. So. But I remember on Sunday afternoons, picking up the phone line and wanting to call either my grandparents or somebody, and I was like, oh, the church ladies are on here singing hymns again. Because they would get home from church, and then they'd want to still have church, so they'd pick up the phone line and occupy the whole party line and sing hymns. My whole point to that story is news travels that faster now than what it did with the little old ladies on the party line. Like we're inundated with this information and news. And we see in Judges 6 and 7, there's this account of a man named Gideon. And God chose Gideon to lead his armies into a victorious battle. There was only one problem. Gideon didn't believe it. Gideon did not believe it. God came to Gideon and and he said, Arise, you mighty man of valor. So that was God's information. You mighty man of valor. Gideon's response was, oh, but I am of the lowest tribe, of the lowest community, of the lowest house, of the lowest of lows. You've got the wrong guy. See, like, he was doing the Moses thing, right? He was disqualifying himself because that was the information that Gideon believed about himself. And he was combating the information that God had of you mighty man of valor with this information. And I love God's response because God, like, didn't even acknowledge it. If you read the story, you'll kind of, I can see God up there just kind of going, mm, okay, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anyhow, <laughs> you mighty man of valor. And I believe it's just as important for us now to align ourselves with the information that God is speaking into our lives. I believe that the battle for information, the battle for identity, the battle for news and who you are and what you are and what's right and what's wrong and what's true and what's not true is more important now as it's ever been. And we need to determine whose report will we believe. We need to dig our heels in as believers and say, I've got information and news and all of this coming from all angles at me but I am grounding myself I am rooting myself like a tree planted by the banks of the river I am deep rooted into the information that's in God whatever God's saying about me whatever God says to me whatever God says in his word that's the information I believe and if I'm going to live well for a living God then I have to have the right information The next thing we need is we need to have the right location. The right location. In 1 Kings 17, we see the the story of Elijah. Elijah has been directed by God to go to the brook Cherith where God provides for him food and water at the brook. But eventually, that brook runs dry. And Elijah has to move to a different location because God's sustenance in his life his sustaining hand in his life had moved locations Carrick and and a couple other people if you've if you've ever coached any type of youth sports in here you'll be able to appreciate this uh, example that I'm getting ready to use I I remember when I helped coach my daughter's middle school basketball team 
you know, there, there was just, you were teaching the basics, trying to, of this, uh, this system, these plays, the reason we're doing this. And, and I remember uh, working with these young ladies on a 2-3 zone. And in the zone, you know, you've got very specific locations that you're supposed to be there. You know, that's, that's your spot, that's your location, you need to leave there. And, and these girls would always be amazed as to why they would give up points. I'm like, well, you're supposed to be here, and you're over here talking to your friend. You're in the wrong location. Also remember, listen, y'all, y'all, y'all are going to end up saying bless his heart on this one, and I have to pray about this because I still laugh about it whenever I think. I was walking into Walmart one time, okay? and all, all good stories start with Walmart. So I was walking into Walmart one time, you know, and they've got like the Jedi master doors there. You know, they've got like two sets of them that if you're a dad, it's a requirement for you to walk up and and automatic doors just open for you, right? And there's like four panes of glass. There's like two panes of glass on this side that are stationary and the two panes of glass that make up the doors that move by themselves. I was following behind this gentleman who was walking. He was probably about 20 feet in front of me. And we were getting closer to the doors, closer to the doors. And I kept noticing that he was like drifting far to the right, like to one of the stationary panes of glass. And I was like, this dude's going to move over at some point, right? Like eventually, I know he's getting closer, like five feet, four feet, three feet, two feet. And the decent human being would have said something. But I'm standing back there going, he's going to stop, right? He's going to stop. And then all of a sudden, like face planted, like full on in stride, boom, stands back. Like, and the doors in the middle had completely opened. And I'm standing back there, and, you know, again, bless my heart. I'm like, are you okay? <laughs> Location's important. <laughs> But see, what happened was Elijah was by this dry brook and had he decided that, no, I'm comfortable here. This is where I need to be. The Lord led me here. Obviously, something's going to give at some point. He would have died at that brook. Why? Because he was in the wrong location. There will be seasons in our lives when God expects us to be in a different location. He will take us from this place to the next place, to the next place. But the thing that we have to make sure of when we're searching for this right location is that it's where God is. It's where God is. Moses, God was done with the children of Israel at one point, and he said, just go. Just go. I'm done with all y'all. Moses is like, "Um, are, are are you going with us? I was like, no, just go. I'm done. I was like, I'm not going if you're not going. And then this, this statement that Moses was just like, listen, if you go, I'll go. I don't care where it is. I'll go wherever your presence is. But if you're not going, I'm not moving. If you're staying here, I'm staying here. I don't care how miserable I am standing right here. I am not moving from this place if your presence does not go with me. And that's how we have to be in our lives. The right location is where the presence of God is dwelling. Amen? Amen. All right, so this next one is that we've got to have the right focus, right? To live well, serving a living God, we have to have the right focus. Job chapter 42. Now, most of us are familiar with this account of what happens in Job's life. Like he loses everything. And listen, we all go through stuff. We all have our trials. We all go through hard times. That's true. And, and every bit of it is valid, and it affects us. But I think that in historical record, if there is anyone who would have had the right to lose focus on what was happening, it was Job. The guy lost everything. And then he was surrounded by really not great friends giving really not great advice to him. But what we see in Job 42 is we see this moment of where Job focuses on what's happening around him instead of what's happening to him. 
He starts meeting and looking and praying for and doing kingdom work in the lives of others. He starts serving others. He starts taking the focus off the inward things that are happening, and he's starting to place it on the things that's happening around him. Folks, the enemy wants you to focus on nothing else or no one else other than yourself and everything that's wrong in your life. And he wants to keep you there. Talk about not the right location. Your focus will determine your location. And if your focus is internal, then you're going to sit by a dry brook, dry up yourself, wither away, and die. Because that's what the enemy wants from you. He wants you internally and inwardly focused. And God's saying, listen, what you're going through is real, but look around. You know what, what happens to me whenever I do that? When I take the attention off of myself, I start looking around and I start seeing others who are hurting. Start seeing others that are suffering. Start seeing others that are going through things that I'm not going through. I begin to look and, say, and think to myself, how blessed am I? How blessed am I? And I kind of love how Job kind of begins to wind all of this stuff up when the words he said earlier in his account really begin to sink into him. Naked I, I came into this world, naked shall I depart. From dust I came, from dust I shall return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's going to take us into our last right thing this morning. And that is having the right atmosphere. Having the right atmosphere. We see in the account of King Saul where he is being tormented by what the Bible calls distressing spirits. That they were coming, coming upon him and distressing him and he was finding himself in, in really, really low places. And what was happening is when he would get to that really low point that the distressing spirits were so heavy on him, he would call for David. And David would come and he would say, bring the boy, have him bring his harp. David would come in and he would start praising God on the harp. And it said that the distressing spirit left. And Saul began to lighten as a countenance. Here's what I want to interject. For you to live well for a living God is you have to choose praise in your life. You have to choose praise. No matter what's happening, no matter what's going on. That's one of the things that God in His sovereignty has said that I am, I am giving to you. You are the one that has the determining vote and factor in whose report you're going to believe, what kind of atmosphere you're going to have, what kind of attitude you're going to have, how you're going to respond. How... You see, what we want to do is we want to respond in kind to what's happening around us. Oh, if I'm walking through this deep, dark pit, then I'm going to reflect the deep, dark pit. Yeah, I heard somebody earlier uh, say, you know, earlier in the week, they say, we're called to respond. We're not called to react. To the situations in our lives, we're called to respond. We're not called to react. They said there's a reason that it's called an emergency response team. So can you imagine if it was emergency react team? Like they show up and somebody, you know, somebody's got an emergency and somebody's like, come, help. We've all heard the 911 calls. Help, help, everything's falling apart. You got to get here quick. Got to get here quick. Got to get here quick. And all of a sudden, the emergency team shows up. And if they're a reacting team and not a responding team, then all of a sudden they're like, oh, we wasn't ready for this. We didn't know what was happening. We've never been trained for this. Help me, Jesus. Somebody call 911. Wait a minute. We are 911. We're called to respond. And that is when we make a conscious effort to say that no matter what I'm facing, no matter what hell I may be walking through, I've still got a reason to praise. With Jesus Christ in my life, it can be the darkest valley I've ever been in in my life, but I've still got a reason to praise. Isaiah states it this way, that it's time to take off the garments of heaviness and put on the garments of praise. David, 
whenever he was facing, he was on the run for his life for almost two decades, hiding out in caves, acting like a crazy person, dwelling with the Philistines, not knowing what was around the next corner. David made the statement that your praise will ever be in my mouth. Your praise will ever be on my lips. We see Paul and Silas in the deepest, darkest darkest prison cell that you could possibly be in at the midnight hour. What were they singing? They were singing praise to God. You see, it's not that the atmosphere defines us. It's how we respond to the atmosphere. That no matter what place we're in, no matter how deep it is, no matter how dark it is, no matter how difficult it is in your life right now, you with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you still have a reason to praise. Amen? That should be good news for somebody in here this morning because you're in the midst of a trial. You're facing something that you've never faced before. The enemy's attacking you in a way that you've never experienced. You may have all but given up hope. What God's wanting to say is it's time for you to take off the garment of heaviness, put on the garment of praise, even if the situation doesn't change, even if the location doesn't change, the atmosphere changes, and I will choose praise. That's what I want to challenge you with this morning. Listen, we all find ourselves in places to where we feel defeated. We feel like we've been beaten down. We've been overwhelmed. And we are absolutely at our wits end and just tired. Anybody ever been there? Like, you're just tired. Through the blood of Jesus Christ that purifies our conscience in order that we can live well for a living God. It's in that moment of when you say, I'm here, I wish I wasn't. This is happening, or this has happened, I wish it hadn't. But regardless, I'm going to choose praise. Because I know that me being able to even draw a breath is a blessing from Jesus Christ that I don't deserve. And I will praise Him for that. And that's what I want to challenge you with this morning. I'm going to ask the praise team if they will to come back and join me. Now here in just a moment, we're going to praise again. And there are times in our lives where we feel like there is no possible way out of where we are. There's no possible deliverance, nothing. And even before we see it, the response for us to live well, for a living God, is for us to praise. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, you've not surrendered your heart and your life to Him, I would urge you, to do so. Respond to the call of God on your heart. If you're here and you're facing dark times, you're facing something that you're struggling with, I urge you to respond during this time. But what I encourage you also with this morning is when we start praising in this song, I want you, I want to challenge you to lift your hands in worship. Now again, this this isn't isn't something we're not we're not talking about emotionalism we're not talking about we're talking about getting uncomfortable and saying that god i've got something on going on in my life and whenever you lift your hands i mean you it can be down here it doesn't matter all right you don't have to get crazy with it but just a simple recognition just a recognition that god i am surrendering myself to you in this situation prayer team i'm going to ask if you would to go ahead and come up if you're here if you have something on your heart you would like for somebody to pray with you please come up let these brothers and sisters pray for you as we stand and as we praise this morning you are here moving in our midst i worship you
worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you.
Man, what a wonderful place to be this morning, amen? amen. We have heard the word indeed this morning, and you know, as, as Ben was preaching, I was thinking about these things that he presented to us, and I was thinking for myself, how am I going to be an active participant in that, in my own life, right? Because, man, passive Christianity is a road to death. We have got to be active participants. We can't just show up and, and forget about it on Sundays and forget about it. We've got to be actively working. We're going to dismiss in prayer, and uh, we want to invite the Dominican team to come down front. We're going to pray over them. Uh, if they would, come on down and um, come right out front. Anybody that wants to come down and, and pray down here with us, uh, you're welcome to do that. If you want to pray in your seats, that's fine also. But if they would come down front, we're going to pray over them. And Father God in heaven, dear Lord, we are so thankful, dear Lord, to be in your house this morning, to hear your word, and to, and to accept, dear Lord, these challenges that, that you put to us through your word. And Father, Father, we have a group here before us, dear Lord, that, are, that Lord is going out to do your work, dear Lord, and, and to do your will, Father, and they have accepted that challenge. And, and Lord, just we ask, dear Father, that you grant them safety. Dear Lord, as they travel, we ask, dear Father, that you give them, dear Lord, just the the strength, dear Lord, to see the things that they're going to see and to do your work and, and to, dear Lord, just share a smile and, and whatever whatever these people need, dear Father, that, that they're going to encounter, dear Lord, we ask that you give them strength, encouragement, dear Lord, from those around them, from, from each other, dear Lord, and Lord, we just ask that you help us here at home to be vigilant in our prayers for them, dear Father, to remind us of that, dear Lord. Father, we just ask that you go with them, dear Lord, and, and bring them safe back home to us. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>